Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to the Explicit Measures podcast with Tommy, Seth, and Mike. Good morning, gentlemen. Happy Tuesday. Happy Tuesday to you both and to oh, everybody whoa. listening this morning. I feel well, like in, I feel like in general, uh, right after Microsoft build, there's a lot of great announcements. And this seems like it's been a pattern for the last two years. They've been doing a lot of announcements around Power BI at build. And leading up to build, there's like not a lot of features being developed because they're kind of holding them all back until build occurs and then build occurs and then we have all these new things to discover and it's always exciting the next couple of months i feel like after build because now you get all the some of those features start getting rolled out into desktop or the other different applications which is kind of fun do you guys feel the same about this is just do you observe the same kind of excitement after build there's like additional features and things coming out they like usually do a pretty good job with on the, to. all the articles well, some of the stuff they talked about, I mean, Fabric was like a big announcement, and this is going to be a long rolling discovery. And it, yeah. I mean, that that in general has really changed a lot of the landscape around what Power BI is doing. And I get a, I'm getting a lot of questions from people about how is this going to change? What is this doing? Um, you know, what's, what's, what's going to occur now that we have all this extra data engineering tools inside Power BI? But I'm just thinking about in general, it just feels like the, the blogs that come out of Microsoft Features that, that are coming out that are just not as Fabric related, they're now coming out now. And I'm hearing, I didn't hear about these other features from like, you know, reminder for, well, a couple things. Um, talking about some of the feature updates in May. Um, they're not talking about Power BI embedded with Microsoft Fabric. The retirement of streaming data flows, which I don't really ever really use that very much. So not sure how well that was doing there. And then. I did a POC long right right when streaming data flows came out. It, it, it was really cool. Like we had we had a, a guy who was very into actually custom building electronics and everything and okay. sending out signals. Yeah. So um, he he proved out this you know uh, loc car locator kind of thing. Right. Mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. did a did a whole experiment where he drove to oh, cool. miles and like we tracked all of that and it was like all real time and it was amazing. But yeah, I mean I don't know how much the the real use case scenario, um, I guess, just didn't pick up or, or take off there. But I agree. I mean, I'll be, it, it, and it makes sense because Build being the ma major, mm -hmm. well, the major developer conference, ironically enough, with this, it's very business centric, right? mm -hmm. which is not really developer centric. We lost around that. Um, yeah. But a lot of, yeah, a lot of all the, there's twofold. One is, and I, I don't know if you're making this point, there are, the big exciting features that start getting rolled out yes. as well as like the new additions. But um, one that I want to talk about today uh, with a blog with um, Chris Webb was all of the ones that were released that nobody noticed up until the lead up because they, it almost like they had to deploy certain parts of this into the mm -hmm. ecosystem <laughs> without mm -hmm. like setting off the, Hey, something brand new and amazing is coming down the road. And I guess the reason why I'm saying this is I just discovered uh, via a tweet on, I think it was on Twitter from Armand, uh, talking about there's a brand new visual in the May version of Microsoft Power BI Desktop. So Desktop is now out. Um, you can go download it today. I'm sorry. It is now the June version of Power BI Desktop. Um, version 2.118 is the new version. It's out. You can go look at it. Inside there, we have a brand new visual, a new card visual. That um, if you're trying to build, you know, in all the a lot of reports have just a couple KPIs across the top of your report, like one KPI, two KPI, three KPI, across the top. This automatic card visual lets you drop in multiple measures and you can build multiple KPIs all in one visual. So it takes like multiple cards and matches them and makes them one large card, which is kind of cool. So anyways, very, nice. very interesting. We heard it here before the blog even was written. Yeah, I know. We caught it before the blog even came out. Well, that's so, hey, the advantage hey, of starting at 7.30 in the morning, I guess. And, and or, and the advantage of joining us live while we discover all these things. There you on go. Interwebs. Yes, exactly. So, we don't even know what we're doing all yet. All 12 of you are ahead of the game. So anyways, that's a pretty cool, I like the feature. I like the card. I think this is going to be a, a really useful, I, I do use a lot of cards on reports and i feel like this will be very helpful as well so one of, one of these same ones is and i don't know if you guys want to paste the the uh the link to chris webb's blog into oh yeah the chat window um, for sure but 
we were just talking how we resave or save Power Query code a couple mm -hmm. of weeks ago. Yep. Chris outlined for us that there was a new feature that was already introduced quietly. Into yes, we saw this. Called yeah. Power Query templates. Yes. So what's really interesting to me about this one is um, I, I think I'm going to make like a hard rule, like every business user has to use Power Query from now on. Yes. <laughs> like anything you're building, you yeah. have to use Power Query. But then like the follow, so what this is for listeners is essentially it's a template. Like you can uh, download a PQT file mm -hmm. that takes all of your query, like all of the whatever queries you generated within the Power Query ecosystem and like extract them and put them into a new Dataflow Gen 2 in Fabric. Yep. Um, and I don't, I don't know if, it's, I didn't hear that it was recognized by Power BI though. It is. So it is. not desktop, but it is in the service. So you have to be Dataflow's right. Gen, Gen 2. Flows. Right, right. Yeah. Gen 2. I don't, I don't think what's it's in desktop. What's crazy yet. about this? What's crazy about this? Why isn't this in Power BI? <laughs> Why isn't this desktop? Why isn't this in desktop? Yeah. Why? Like Microsoft, get it in desktop, please. Like I know, this, right? This would have it would have been a very easy, small, short conversation. <laughs> Add this feature to your desktop. Was like this is in there, and we don't have to worry about it. Alex, <laughs> you're listening. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> he, and, he comments PQT binary. Hmm. Unzip it. <laughs> like oh, okay. No. Yes. No. <laughs> so um, I I do like these things, and I, and again, this was a. I know it's been around in Excel for quite a long time because when you export things, it's there, but it has not been exposed to anything in the Power BI realm until recently. And that was um, in Fabric Dataflow Gen 2 is when I first noticed this Q PQ template. And I've actually found it from Alex Powers' um, introduction to Fabric. So in Fabric, when you're doing the introdu introduction classes, Alex uses this to get you started inside Power Query. Hey, go download this file from the GitHub, go use, you know, upload this file here, and there it works. And it's just, all code it's just a you know from what i found you unzip it and it's just straight code inside there just like a json object so so there you go tommy there's another there's another nail in the desktop coffin as alex says don't waste a single minute on power query in desktop bring power query online to desktop even though this is literally the <laughs> enabled in excel when you can <laughs> export it so yeah no problem. well not for you not for you no. tommy not, not for me. your tool that you use it's only Excel or online. Only Excel. I, I create Power Query templates. Either way, either way. Cool, cool thing. Read the blog. Check it out. Um, yeah. Templates in Power Query. Get 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 them. Use them. Yeah, I like them as well. Any other? We have a couple other kind of just quick announcements here. Um, any other kind of key notes here? Tommy is now officially a Microsoft trainer, so we should definitely. Ooh. Good job, Tommy. Uh, you're an MCT, um, is what it's technically called. Microsoft, what does it stand for? Microsoft Certified, certified trainer. certified Trainer. So a lot of hoops you got to jump through. You've got to record yourself doing like a training and doing it a certain way um, to, in order to get, you know, the certification from the organization. So congratulations on that. Thanks, man. No, it's really exciting because all the training that I've been doing uh, for clients, for uh, for conferences, like, man, this just kind of makes sense. But now with the, with the Microsoft certified trainer one, maybe a little more trust when I go into a uh, unknown territory that, like, Oh, maybe he knows what he's talking about. <laughs> but, just in uh, case the other MVP <laughs> title doesn't, and, didn't, exactly. didn't allude to that. <laughs> yeah. Um, but honestly, now I have access to all the, the actual certifications and the exams and the lab yeah. modules and the sources. So that's really cool because there's probably, there's three power platform courses right now or cert, like uh, mm -hmm. exams. It's amazing the content that Microsoft has. Obviously, everything with Azure. Nothing for Fabric yet, but I'm sure it's coming. I agree. Give it time. Well, that's that's exciting. Yeah. Tommy, when when I want my next certification, can I come to you? Yeah, I can help, help you me. out. I can help yes. you out. So. <laughs> <laughs> Train me up, Tommy. Train me up. <laughs> Um, I don't have anything else really major on the Microsoft blog that kind of came out. Uh, I don't have any other incredible announcements, unless you guys have any other things you want to pick up on here. There's this one from Formu around, uh, so Gilbert out of Australia was talking briefly around creating a hierarchy for field parameters for easy navigation. Kind of a neat little tip and trick <clears throat> to help yourself out there. 
Have you used this before, Tommy? So obviously he used field parameters, but the way he, um, the way that he did this is actually really neat. But um, Gilbert really used field parameters to create a hierarchy for just choosing your measures. Mm -hmm. So, which I really, yeah, yeah. It's like just sales one, and orders. Like you have, I had yeah. a like pick which things you want to see in a measure, right? Yeah, and it's just one of those kind of not hacks or things that people find out like, oh, I guess you could combine, uh, you know, yeah. the field parameters and doing dynamic measures into something really neat for my purely for user experience. Mm -hmm. So kind of another little neat uh, tip or trick, more of like a user functional functionality. Like you can yeah. just yeah. something you may not have known you could build, but you know, in reality, it, it totally makes sense. If you're gonna have a list of measures, you may want to order them. Here's all my sales measures and it, here's all my orders measures. So a really good article as well. So maybe another one that you want to check, check out uh, additionally. Yeah. Excellent. I don't think I have any other ones that were really major at this point. I'll double check if there's any other. I, oh, it's always hard to keep up with things. That's kind of one of the big challenges. Like this is why I like using uh, jam.power BI tips because I uh, will frequently go there and as I find articles, I just stick them there and I forget that they're there. And so I think, oh shoot, there's a whole bunch of articles here. <laughs> I need to go back and, and check them out and see which, what did I save? And I'm actually kind of cruising through here. It's like, a, so your five minutes is how fast can I rip through the internet and find yes, interesting? <laughs> exactly right. Like the first parts of articles that catch my interest, I'll add them in there. And mm -hmm. then when I have 15 minutes, which only happens when you're looking at it in the podcast. Exactly right. <laughs> you buy, you, you re rehash what you put in there. <laughs> There's so much good stuff. I mean, Tommy, you added a ton is. of stuff in there. Like Reza yeah. Rad's coming out with like, you know, Data Lake versus Warehouse versus Data Mart. You know, um, you know, people are talking about data governance in Microsoft Fabric. What are roles and domains? Like, there's this new there's this new feature that came out with, with Fabric is a domain, like a collection of workspaces. Yep. It, it's good stuff. I mean, there's really great articles. Uh, uh, David Eldersfeld is doing 40 days of Fabric, and he's starting off with days one. What is what is Fabric? There's a lot of really interesting like content coming out. Well, for get to check out Jammed Out Power BI Tips, we have a new Fabric nested collection. Oh, good job, Tommy. Check it yeah. out. Love it. So we just put that in there. And then I think we have already 36 articles for just fabric. Let's go. Let's go. Let's get some stuff going. I'm sure that will cool. be filling up fairly quickly here as we, as fabric, you know, people get around fabric and understand it and start really building on top of it. Yeah. I didn't include any of the actual, the Microsoft learning content so yeah. far into that, but I think just the uh, trying to navigate Microsoft's documentation for Fabric, I feel like their navigation's a little to be desired because you go from the NDM tutorials, mm -hmm. but then you're like, wait, am I in am I in Azure Synapse now or am I still in Fabric? Do they just yes. copy replace a name? Yes, exactly. So, mm, yeah, maybe. <laughs> so where does this go? Kind of thing. I'm like, what data set am I using? So I mean, there's like we talked about when Fabric got launched they came out of the gates running with their documentation and their guides yes so this kind of is a good lead into our topic for today so today uh, actually last week on thursday we talked a little bit around this thing called okay do we decide between a in fabric you have this ability to make a pipeline copy activity you can do a data flow gen 2 or you can use the spark engine each of these areas kind of target different audiences around you know what kind of the persona of that area, right? So a, a pipeline kind of comes from Azure Data Factory or Synapse. Data flow comes directly from desktop. That's something that we're familiar there. And then the Spark engine is kind of this data engineering realm. Uh, it kind of came from Synapse because that was really the only major way you could interact with a Spark notebook. So that's another area of investment there. Um, so looking to this, we're trying to extend the conversation before because we talked a lot about this one article <laughs> and we never really got to the different user personas. So at the bottom of the article, and I'll put the link of the article right here in the chat window so everyone can um, enjoy it and read it again or go check it, check it out again. This is the article. And at the bottom of the article, there's scenario one, scenario two, and scenario three. So maybe Seth, maybe you want to you know, take us a bit Ooh. through, do a little read through here on this one and give us a bit of, let's, I'd like to talk about the different personas that are here. Yeah. And maybe some gaps that we see in the description of these personas potentially. Maybe pick them apart a bit. 
Scenario one, Leo, a data engineer, needs to ingest a large volume of data from external systems, both on-premises and cloud. These external systems include databases, file systems, and APIs. Leo doesn't want to write and maintain code for each connector or data movement operation. He wants to follow the medallion layer's best practices with bronze, silver, and gold. Leo doesn't have any experience with Spark, so he prefers the drag-and-drop UI as much as possible with minimal coding, and he also wants to process the data on a schedule. Probably good enough right there, uh, right? Yeah. Do you think we need to go to the next paragraph? Well, I, I, let's talk about this one because I just got really confused because I started with data engineer, which puts me in a realm of your coder. Okay. And then like, okay. at the end, it's like, he prefers the drag and drop UI. And I'm like, <laughs> does he not really? this person at all. Does he really? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Power BI Park it hit, hit the other comment I was going to make, which was like, my voice just immediately went into like audiobook mode or, yes. or like, uh, <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's what you get. I went, I went, Seth, I want you to navigate my directions on my GPS now. I went. Okay. I, I turn left. Yeah. Turn turn left. Exactly. Exactly. Unfortunately, these scenarios read very similar to those Chevy commercials. Whenever they show, like, are you a, a you know modern teenager going to be twenty five? It's like, yeah, I'm twenty five, and I'm thinking I have a kid. Well, there's this perfect part of the car for you. It's like, well, I don't want to be constrained by gas. So we've added uh, all these new features. It sounds like the personas built by the features. Yes. Yes, it's yeah, a, rather yes. than it's all the way around. It's backwards. Yeah, yes. You have to look at those Chevy commercials because I can't stand them. We're anyways, but so he must be a Ford guy then. Well, he's yeah, everything he's like, he wants to process data on a schedule. He wants to do a feature, feature, feature. But yes. Yeah, and I agree with the when we're talking about the data engineer, because that also goes back to the personas. Okay. Everybody's a date. Yes. Okay. okay. So, so let's read between the lines here and not get hung up, I think. And this is maybe what the confusing part is. We got hung up in our last conversation around the name. Correct. Of the job title. Let's right? just so it's like, data okay, engineer. this is, this is a person who's doing some ETL. Apparently they're not, they don't do it a lot or they only do it in UI type environments. Okay. Right? In this scenario, I would drop the descriptor of, so exactly, I love how you said that, Seth. This, I would for sure drop the APIs. This user does not right. understand or use or want to use APIs if they're doing a drag and drop experience. Um, and if you're grabbing database and files, that, that, feels like, that feels like the persona, right? I'm a user who's trying to absorb data from a database, and there's flat files coming from somewhere that I've got to ingest. Yeah, so I, I am going to read the second part because it just adds to my confusion. Well, oh, <laughs> yeah, yes. Okay, yes. Yeah, okay, so Leo is going beyond, right? Yeah. So here's more about so, what Leo so does. So now, right, so now we know Leo apparently understands databases, file systems, and APIs, but still likes to do, and wants bronze, silver, gold, so he knows those concepts, but he only likes drag and drop UI in terms of implementation. That That's already a struggle for me. The first step is to get the raw the first step is to get the raw data into bronze layer lake house from Azure Data Resources and various third party sources like Snowflake Web, REST, AWS S3, GCS, etc. Because you know Leo's gonna have access to all that. All those clouds. Exactly. He he wants a consolidated lake house because he knows what that is. So that all the data from various lob <laughs> line of business, on premises, and cloud source resides in a single place. Leo reviews the options and selects pipeline copy activity as the appropriate choice for his raw binary copy. This pattern applies to both historical and incremental data refresh, both concepts he knows. With copy activity, Leo can load gold data to a data warehouse with no code if the need arises and pipelines provide high scale data ingestion that can move petabyte scale data. Copy activity is the lo best low code and no code choice to move petabytes of data to lake houses and warehouses from various varieties of sources either ad hoc or via a schedule if you are ad hoc moving petabyte scale data boy i'm gonna have a conversation with you <laughs> <laughs> well i mean okay so I, to, okay to so defend that so defend where are we at ad where are we at? schedule okay so where are we at so ad hoc scheduling stuff like i i could understand that you're going to do like initial load of your so this when i see ad hoc type loading i feel like it comes from Hey, we're going to turn off this server. We need to go get all the data from it. So build a process to load everything from it once. That's like your ad hoc. 
Mm -hmm. I feel like. And there may be other use cases around that, but that's just things that I feel. But uh, to your point, Seth, I mean, we feel like we're mixing a bit of business user and we're mixing a bit of data engineer. And I would, I think I'd come very closely to your argument of if Leo understands all these multiple concepts and once again, everything, he understands the concept of putting all the data together. Yeah, we're, we're, we're still, we're solidly talking a data engineer who knows how to write code. I would, I would expect your training to be on that persona to be more SQL and database and writing store procedures and so, being able to and do I, those things. And I agree. Like it, to me, it's not necessarily like you have to be a coder, but a lot of these are really large concepts. Yes. It's like, okay. Okay. Like maybe let, let's just read down now throughout the, through the table. This is where, where would you use a pipeline copy activity? So maybe this is just describing that, Hey, in this use case, we don't have to do heavy transformations or anything. Um, a pipeline copy activity is what you would be shooting for because you don't have to do any of that heavy lifting. And honestly, yes, the, the copy activity itself is extremely easy to implement. And if all you have to do is move data from one location mm-hmm. to another, mm-hmm. yeah, that's, that's your bag, right? Like you don't have to re- create some custom, you know, Jupyter notebook or transformation or data movement process. Like it's literally just drop an activity, connect to a source, put in destination and that's it. Yeah. But the, the pipeline copy activity, or at least the pipeline has, I believe all of the activities that Azure data factory has in synapse types, correct? When it comes to variables, when it comes to parameters. So, Yes, for a basic copy, fine, but that's not one either A, the data engineer, the people who have been uh, accustomed to the pipeline um, UI in the past, mm-hmm. who are they, right? They they live in Azure. They live in Data Factory or Synapse. Yeah, I, so, I guess I, I guess my confusion here is like this, this is the entry point, right? This is the lowest level of user knowledge base mm-hmm. right to 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 use something in fabric for mm-hmm. um copy data flow etc so copying information so this is your lowest common denominator related to you know a, a, a utilizing some of these tools so i would argue that you shouldn't start with pipeline of of the experiences that i enjoyed most so when i learned things i started with power query so I started with data flows, basically. So data flows where I started. Of the user interfaces that make the most sense to be able to build basic loading of data, I'd honestly argue data flows is actually a better first step than to go all in on a pipeline. Pipelines, yes, they do have, telling you what you said, param- parameters, and they have variables. But to be honest, it took me a little bit of time to get my head mm-hmm. around, like, yeah. what was a... flip these. Yeah, I would flip-flop mm-hmm. these. So I would say, you know... And I, I would also argue that, you know, scenario one is just kind of more about, a, and again, I would, I'd like to see a persona here that's more of like a business user centric persona. It's did they all of these one in here. There is change it? now. There's a business analyst in Dataflow. Um, or did we miss that in our previous conversation? No, no. I, I'm, I'm talking about the scenarios though. So that each scenario is Leo, Mary and Adam, and they're all data engineers. Okay. So I don't, I don't think they slipped it in the bottom portion. It's in the table. But maybe, yeah, it's in the table. Yeah, so they have a business analyst in there. And that's where, honestly, I think I would start with that one, right? To me, the, this most simplified experience is data flows. Um, I have data. I need to pull it together. And I feel, I feel like when I talk about pipeline activities, the pipeline activities, if I had to, what was, what was before pipelines? It was store procedures. Like to me, the the most closest data engineering exercise is well, it's SSIS. SSIS. It's SIS. It's store procedures. It's like that that system of automation of like loading data in. We can now just replace that with pipelines, and so that's where I feel like a lot of for organizations, if you have those SSIS procedures, this is a good replacement for a pipeline to replace those things and orchestrate multiple things together. I think this is so. Let's lean into this one a little bit because I agree in scenario two outlines what you're talking about, Mike, and where my misconception went first, which is if I'm presenting this to an audience that has absolutely no idea what you you are trying to tell them because you yes. call it fabric. Yes. Um give it give it from the 
business user easiest level to intermediate to pro professional enterprise. Correct. Yes. Right? Everything exactly. should the be in story. the vein of yes. yeah, everything should be in the vein of hey, you're a curious business user, right? Like this, here's step this, one. This is you. I like this that. This is the next person. This is yes. That. And if, if I all agree. the documentation aligned to easy, middle ground, you know, hard, yep. then then I think the adoption or people who had like business folks who had the drive to like learn more. Yes. And go deeper. Would resonate would re this would resonate more with them. And I think it's even, a great way of saying it. Time, this is the second time we're talking about it, we're just realizing, like, oh yeah, that's not that's not really aligned in yeah. in uh, in that regard. And I and I like how you're approaching this, Seth, because this I mean, fabric is coming to Power BI. You're already starting with Power BI, which is a large business, you know, uh business focused, mm -hmm. right? It's the business focused type of tool. And so now we're and this is this is the story that we we've been kind of complaining about on the podcast. Whereas we need more of the grow up story of Power BI, and this is yeah. this is the support for that grow up story. And I like this, but we have to think about okay, who are our current user bases of Power BI? And it starts with the business user. It starts with Power Query. It yeah. starts with I'm doing everything in a single file. I'm not thinking about medallion architectures. I'm starting with uh, I load data. I just drop it into a workspace and done. Like we move on. And so this is, this is fits very well with our moniker of act like the business, yeah. but think like it, right? So you start building things today, add value right now, but then you have to think about what does sustainability look like? How do I refresh the data? What happens over time? Those kind of things. And if, if, if I'll, I keep cutting you off, go ahead, Tommy. No, no, I think the biggest thing for me when we're, I think I'm getting frustrated with the pipelines here is they do this very simple action copy uh, from a folder from an Azure blob. And I would disagree that, no, we can d just do this in data flows um, to try to get multiple files from multiple yeah. folders and yep. data flows is not a great solution, uh, especially if it's in a different uh, format. It's really just meant to, in a sense, move it over like a, a parquet file or CSV t to a Delta table. That's not what uh, even Gen 2 Power BI data flows is going to be good at. Um, to try to iterate over multiple files in a folder, uh, it can do it. But when we're dealing with, like, let's say the Azure Blob Storage, right? That's where the general template is here. Um, and you have seven folders, I think, with the, the worldwide importers. They each have their own uh, yearly files. Mm -hmm. That's a lot more work to do in a data flow, which you, I wouldn't really recommend just to move it over from the Azure Blob to the lake house. Right. Well, so again, I'm going to, yes, I think I agree with you, but I, I would also maybe kind of bring things up a little bit one layer higher than what you're talking about. I think to the end user, we don't really care what's under the hood. The end user doesn't care if it's one lake or blob storage or tables or not, or Delta, like the end user should, all this should be transparent to them. Right. So mm -hmm. one of, one of my complaints with what Power Query does today is, and I think Dataflow's Gen 2 potentially starts to solve this problem is if I have a table of information, if I'm going to bring a bunch of information down to my data, my Power BI environment, I have, what is the, what is the value of a record right now? And I have slowly changing dimensions. Those are my main two concerns as I work with data systems. So make it very easy for me to go get, what is the current version of a record, the key and the most recent value of that record and, and give me the uh, the other version of that record where I can see, okay, here's the value of that record and here's how it changed and what day it changed on each day. But I don't care about everything else technology wise. I just want a table to show up and use it. Like that's literally all I want as a business user. So I think a lot of these personas start talking about like the underlying, you know, decisions and architectures and things that make more sense for like the, the enterprise. But I'd like to start more of that high level. I just need a table. That's all I want. Sure. So let's talk about scenario two in a slightly different. Yeah, let's go to two. Walk through. Mary is a data engineer with a deep knowledge of the multiple line of business analytical reporting requirements. An upstream team has successfully implemented a solution to migrate multiple lobs, historical and incremental data into a common lake house. Mary has been tasked with cleaning the data, 
applying business logics and loading it into multiple de destinations such as Azure SQL DB, ADX, and a lake house in preparation for their respective reporting teams. Mary is an experienced Power Query user, and the data volume is in the low to medium range to achieve desired performance. Data flows provide no-code or low-code interfaces for ingesting data from hundreds of data sources. With data flows, you can transform data using 300 plus data transformation options and write the results into multiple destinations with an easy to use, highly visual user interface. Mary reviews the options and decides that it makes sense to use Dataflow Gen 2 as her preferred transformation option. I feel like part of that was like marketing. <laughs> <laughs> the whole, that whole, yes, the whole thing felt marketing, especially the way you read it. Yes. So, so by the way, this is your scenario though, like where okay. data flows comes into play. But like, what's the difference between one and two? Like, obviously, it's data volume. Yes, they're definitely, and they made a very emphasis on data flows is for your medium to small mounts. Like, that makes sense. I would also argue here. Scenario two, I don't think is very relevant when I'm talking about I need to load the data to yep. multiple locations like yep. Azure SQL, yes. ADX, and Lakehouse. I, I, again, this is one thing. I don't care where the data goes. I think all we're trying to do is, you know, Mary should be focusing on loading tables into workspaces that people can touch and use. Mary should be focusing on making a handful of data models for the organization. But Mary's working on the enterprise data. So, yes. She's got deep knowledge of the line of business logic. Mary should be thinking right. about how, what things do I need to produce for the business? I'm building reports, I'm building data models, or I'm building tables of data that I'm going to let another team go consume and use. That's her. That should be her role. So talking about Azure SQL, not relevant, right? Talking about Lakehouse, not relevant. To me, this is all around generating those tables and figuring out how to secure table access for other teams. What's interesting to me, though, is like, so let's, this, this challenges, this challenges, I guess, some of the, the who's doing what parts of this, right? Like if I'm bringing data into an ecosystem, it, I don't know, I'm confused. We'll just, there's a whole team, like to me, uh, Leo, right? The team above, you know, Leo is the data engineer, right? Leo is feeding data to Mary. Like mm -hmm. well, that's the way it reads. That's the way it reads. Yeah. Like there's a, there's another sure. team that is like the central BI team, and they're doing things that are maybe at a higher volume. You know, maybe they're getting millions of, or or hundreds of millions of transactions a month, and they're just trying to distill this down for Mary. But where like Mary should be focusing on accessing the enterprise BI. Mary should be focusing on what data sources that the business needs that is not included in enterprise BI or but enterprise reporting. To me, that makes a lot more sense here. Okay, hey, look. I'm going to grab all these sources from enterprise BI solutions, whether Lakehouse, SQL, whatever. Her source becomes these internal systems, Snowflake, I don't care, right? All those systems are doing some level of data engineering prior to Mary touches it. And Mary goes, oh, by the way, I have this Salesforce table that I need. I'm going to pull, pull that in. So Mary brings in some extra data sources to enrich the data above and beyond what the enterprise team gives her so the business can do their job. Like that makes more sense for, for Mary's role. Would you guys agree or am I off base on that one? Yeah, I guess what I'm I'm challenged with is like scenario, now we're talking about two scenarios ahead, ahead of scenario as well, is okay, I, I've now been provided a layer of information from a different team that I'm going to go apply business logic on top of. To To what end? Like, do I now have a table for Mary and it's the same table that scenario three is going to pick up, but we're just going to do the same transformations on an enterprise level where we need to. And those are two different things now. And I have business in the same environment creating artifacts that or extracting data for purposes over in Power BI, like for reporting, but then I'm going to have enterprise. Yeah. And this is where it's like, okay, clearly in the enterprise space, prior to fabric i i had a very clear understanding of what schemas what tables what things were doing what for the purposes of um enterprise level reporting and the challenge was taking artifacts from the business that they were creating and when in when needed elevate them right but now i'm going to have both of those in the same ecosystem 
I, I just like how I'm still wrapping my head around like and, how that works. Yeah. So, and uh, like they are, all of these roles are mutually separate. There's not, I don't think there's ever going to be a situation and not to get ahead of one person with one project going, Hmm, pipelines, uh, data flows or, or notebooks. And sure. I think this person, Mike, you, you had a perfect point of the data flow person, especially with the, how, uh, rich the feature set is in with data flows and now with gen two. Mm -hmm. Um, and we've talked about that, a grow up story with data flows where I can apply more of the business logic, connect to different sources. And the, the end goal of the, uh, for any data flow or the end goal for that, usually that scenario is to structure. However, the, that previous step was the final table, the final data. It's not pulling in usually the raw files, especially now that we have everything with fabric, but it's, mm -hmm. it's the structure of the data types is doing some additional logic with the columns. It's a lot, mm -hmm. yes. um, you know, it's merging different sort of, like you said, like, okay, yeah. we need Salesforce, we need the Salesforce. Exactly. Yep. And it's to finally come in where now, again, not just to only be in power BI, but it can get pushed to a lake house can push to, for, yes. you know, uh, obviously to for reporting in power BI, but the, the copy data, or at least the pipelines, you know, those are, these are mutually exclusive people, I think, because one, the person who, who has been doing data flows uh, exclusively now has probably not been dealing too much with at, like the synapse pipelines. Um, I'm assuming the overlap is not. Yes, I would agree. And the yes. same way, the yes. other way. Yep. And I think that's, I think this is our, our point here, right? You're, you're absorbing. So Power BI does its thing. And what we're doing here is we're absorbing two other additional roles yes. into Power BI where we're adding this ability. Hey, we've, we built Synapse. It didn't go so well. We're now bringing the Synapse features directly into Power BI. Hey, we have this data science thing. Well, the data scientists need all the data that comes out of Power BI. So we might as well bring that persona or that, that workflow into what Power BI is doing. So these two other things are being added into what Power BI is doing. And I could even potentially see here, like when you start loading up SQL servers and bringing SQL servers into Fabric, yep. there's actually the ability to have not only your entire data analytical system inside Fabric, you potentially could even add your transactional system or an app that's built to be transactional inside Fabric mm -hmm. because now there's a SQL server. And I, you know, I, and I think of... You know, the reason why you want SQL Server around is SQL Server is great for a database that supports an app. That's another element you could just bring right into Fabric. So now you have potentially another persona here that's not being talked about, which could be a little bit like an app developer, also inside Fabric. So app developers, data engineers, um, and then the business users. So the story I would like to see happening here between Mary and Leo is the grow up story of the enterprise. Yeah. Hey, look, we are going to give wider access to the business. They're going to connect to a lot of data sources. We're going to define what those sources are, and we're going to give those sources back over to Leo in the engineering team. You know, Mary's out in, out in front of the IT organization, connecting to data sources and making value from data. Leo shows up and says, Hey, we're ready to hand off this data transition. Show me what you built, Mary. Mary shows, Mary shows Leo all the work that was done inside data flows and leo says hey i can do the same things in pipelines and then i can own it and, and a tool that i'm familiar with and we can now absorb more data then leo jumps in and starts handing taking part of those data loading processes and so the story here is the same table name that mary developed using power query that power query transformation can then just get removed those steps can be folded into pipelines and then the table name stays the same, the data model stays the same, but now we've got an IT, a grown up process yes. that runs on pipelines. Like to me, that's where I think this stuff makes sense. I guess we should move on to, well, sorry, I'll just pause there. I said a lot of things. Seth, you're gonna no, say something? No, that's fine. Um, yeah, we can move on to scenario three if you want. I'm gonna do Adam. Adam, Adam. our data engineer. Adam is a data engineer working for a large retail company that uses a lake house to store and analyze its customer data. As part of his job, Adam is responsible for building and maintaining the data pipelines that extract, transform, and load data into the lake house. 
One of the company's business requirements is to perform customer review analytics to gain insights into their customers' experiences and improve their services. Adam decides the best option is to use Spark to build the extract and transformation logic. Spark provides a distributed computing platform that can process large amounts of data in parallel. He writes a Spark application using Python or Scala, which reads structured, semi-structured, and unstructured data from one lake for customer reviews and feedback. The application cleanses, transforms, and writes data to Delta tables in the lake house. The data is then ready to be used for downstream analytics. Why does that specifically talk about Delta tables and lake house, whereas scenario two doesn't, but the artifact is Delta tables? Right. I don't... I think the artifact of Delta Tables is almost irrelevant at this point. I mean, if anything, Adam's the one who's actually studied Delta Tables and understands what's in a Delta Table. Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, so, yeah. Because he's using Spark. At Spark, you have to understand fundamentally what's a Delta Table doing. So you're, st you're spending some effort there at that level going, okay, I'm going to go in deep on understanding what is a Delta Table. And that's com dealing with scenario three. I mean, this is completely, I feel it doesn't even fit on the page to be kind of honest. Uh, oh, really? Yeah. This is what I'm most comfortable with. <laughs> well, yeah, but it should be its own page. It should be scenario one, yeah. scenario two. Please click here for something a little bit <laughs> more advanced. A little more advanced. Well, think about it though. I mean, how many users, maybe the, uh, the, those who are doing pipelines, but doing, you know, advanced pipelines, not just a single action to copy data. Yes. Um, obviously, pro have experience with Spark, with uh, notebooks. Um, but for the data flow user, how often do you think they're also doing that, uh, you know, engineering that transformations with Spark or Jupyter Notebooks are going to Databricks? Possibly. Um, but they have two, they have very, very different purposes. And also, they're really. Uh, perform much better for uh, you know in certain situations. Uh, Jupyter notebooks to take the files turn it into a table. You know, I've tested this with the Fabric Ready and data flows. If you're trying to take a lot of Parquet files or a lot of CSV files from a blob or uh, uh, a lake house, it's very slow to try to convert that and do all this the same transformations you normally would. Um, in a data flow and yes. that's not where you would even think of putting your production just to take the files and push into an merge into one table so let me let me give you a pattern that i've been using and seth i think you use this pattern very well as well and how i think about this this world right i think of data flows or so let's, let's start the pipeline the pipeline i feel like is best suited for calling apis that makes it fairly easy to call an api uh, data flows also makes it a lot easier, or the pipelines make it a lot easier to call a token, right? So I have a, I have a an API that needs a token that I need to pass to a secondary API call that then makes gets data. So I really like the pipeline for collect, connecting two sources and loading them down to the lake, like just just getting the raw form of data. That makes a lot of sense to me. What's not being talked about here is in the process of loading data to reporting on data. There's this middle area in the middle of the system where it's called, it's technically like a black box, right? Data comes in, transformations occur to that data, and then out comes star schema or star schema like tables that you could then use inside a data set in Power BI. So to me, this black box middle area is what do I do to transform the data? How am I cleaning it? How am I building my dimensions? How am I building my fact tables? And that is best served either through data flows gen two, looking at more of that business user centric area. But if I have more of an IT or a, a central team working on that, and, or if I have, a, to your point, Tommy, a lot of small files, Spark makes more sense to go grab these other semi-structured or unstructured data sets and use Spark because Spark can do images. You can go, you can do other things with it. Like there's, there's a whole bunch of other things that come along with the Spark engine that add a bunch of value there. And I would also argue in the, yes, you can connect Spark to basically anything, but I have found massive issues when trying to connect Spark to SQL servers or any other, like Oracle servers. There's like all these special drivers that you need to include on the Spark system to be able to communicate or talk to these other data source systems. So Spark's not the greatest mm -hmm. at being able to regularly connect to these other systems. And if you do use these custom libraries, and that's my big beef with here, what they describe in Spark, 
in the table above, it says there are hundreds of sources and Spark libraries for sources, and there's hundreds of Spark libraries for destinations. Yes, there are, but that really limits you and how much you can upgrade your Spark engine if you're trying to stay current on Spark. Because these li every library that you bring to Spark has to stay in tune or has to stay updated with whatever version of Spark that's being released. So if your library is not being updated, you, your version of Spark is stuck <laughs> at a certain level. And that creates all kinds of problems because the newer versions of Spark are getting faster and more efficient and can query data with better speed and efficiency. So you always want to stay close to the newest version of Spark, I feel like. Anyways, well, that's my, and, my world. And eventually you'll reach a breaking point where your code doesn't work. That's true. Moving yes. Moving to the next version. Yes. Right? So now yeah. you're on versioning and code redeployment. Correct. So if you're not the one writing the library that you're going to use to connect to the stuff, it's not worth it. So anyways, that's my, my perspective on these things. I, I yeah. Here, here's where, where I guess I... I'm I'm reading through these different ways to transform data, right? The, obviously, different levels of of user and their understanding to fit into, I guess, these three different methods. But where where I'm struggling is does that does that mean we're creating or have a a base level set of tables that we're working from, right? Like, has somebody because scenario two doesn't work unless the tables already exist for her to start modifying and then Correct. sending data other locations which is still confusing to me yes but okay that person's going to start pushing data into different systems mm -hmm. i guess the first question i have is, is is that because i i suppose you'd have a third party or like you'd have a different system where you would need that data as opposed to it just being stored in one lake and visible for all your your reporting needs from a power bi perspective where this where I don't, I'm not putting together the dots here, is if if the documentation is meant to assist people in making a decision of like how you go about implementing things, the use case for which to do so has to be part of it, right? And it it isn't, right? And and what I mean by that is like if I'm looking at these in the context of a workspace and the permissions allotted to people within a workspace across these ecosystems like and i have a table as a common starting point it's saying that i could have you know a user come in called mary and start doing data engineering activities against those tables for the purposes of the reporting for this workspace for power bi reporting but then moving data to other locations and what is the difference between that and somebody else who doesn't have access to the same workspace rebuilding the same thing? Mm -hmm. Like, cause there's not, there's not inherent visibility across these, these workspaces, which are no. delineating the visibility for people to work within the silos. And then you're also assuming that I guess I have the ETL engineers or the data engineers that have an enterprise focus on them. To yes. create the base tables for these people to work with. And they're just supposed to see this ecosystem blow up in all the different workspaces where people are just building their own things as opposed to uniformly creating an object that business can inherently understand that is like all of your business logic is wrapped up into this thing. And if you need to modify it, go ahead. Mm -hmm. But you shouldn't need to. Like it almost reads like uh, if, if, bronze silver gold is the standard in scenario one are they like are we creating silver and expecting all these other users and all the workspaces to create their own gold laters that's what uh, i don't like how are how are, you butt that up against maybe the mental block that we have which is um i would have loved to have seen microsoft adopt the matthew roach architecture uh, paradigm of yep. how do you level up because yep. every organization he's a cat team member so he's engaging with the largest organizations in the world and he doesn't just come up with this framework on his own right he obviously yep. sees a need that organizations and we talk about and it resonates deeply mm. how do you how does it make sense for us to use analytics in our ecosystem okay. i like and this i think this is a missed opportunity because to you align would, to like, the adoption roadmap Absolutely. Yeah. I like, I think that's a great opportunity. So, okay. You so have a single platform. You okay. have all these tools that you're bringing together. You have mm -hmm. this in these environments and like, what, why would you not align that 
to something that makes yes. business sense to help oh, sell I like this, this to help sell it. This is great. I love this part. This this point is really strong here. Okay, so let's let's tease this out tease this out a bit. All right. Let's think about Matthew Roach's pyramid, right? So in the Matthew Roach pyramid, around different layers of data, there's personal reporting at the bottom of the pyramid. There's team reporting. So like an, a, a group of people, a smaller group of people. There's departmental and there's enterprise. There's basically four layers here. So I would see this article should be written inside the four layers of what Matthew's talking about, right? There should be four personas, one for each of those groups. And so there's going to be persona number one. I'm an individual contributor. I'm looking at my own stuff. I'm focusing on collecting data that other people have made, whether it's workspace related or something else. What do I use? I think we would, we would agree that person should focus solely on data flows. I'm an individual contributor. I'm getting a bunch of stuff. I'm using desktop and maybe PowerBI.com, the service. Maybe I have a workspace that I'm participating in. I'm doing all my work there to figure out what isn't valuable in the data. Next level up team level reporting team level reporting should be still focusing on i've been given data sources from the data engineering team the bi team i'm looking for other data sources that are non-existent in my you know bi generated tables there's some extra data that's coming from salesforce or other cloud providers i'm trying to get that data in i would also argue that that second layer a majority of that should be around focusing on uh, data flows would you guys agree no, I absolutely. And I think you're getting to something where there's absolutely here the doc, the the confusion is kind of getting a lot clear. These roles and these situations are not exclusive. Um, they're much they're very inclusive, and it's usually going to be more than one person. There should be a team involved with this. Who what part of the uh, project and what part of the journey is going to be done? in in notebooks and, and spark what part of that process is going to be done in pipeline okay yeah let's keep going up the tree like you're saying tommy like i like yep. that so like the next term on this hierarchy that Matt, matthew roach provided is okay now we're talking departmental reporting what does departmental reporting look like mm -hmm. okay departmental reporting takes things from teams and brings them to a department level someone's part so we're now getting to a point where we're integrating more with a central bi team we're now talking a bit more with the center of excellence we're looking at data sources that lived in the team level, data flows that were supporting a small amount of data or not doing incremental refresh. And now we're having questions asked at the department level where we need more capability around incremental refresh or tables or data. So the departmental team now starts incorporating pipeline activities. So now let's start, let's start loading lots of data into pipelines. Let's start thinking about a medallion type architecture at the department level maybe that makes sense there and then potentially even integrating some very designed teams maybe some teams are at the department level thinking about using spark and notebooks they're doing their own data engineering so at the department level the department is trying to grab data from many sources they have the need to load data from the enterprise systems or other large cloud providers and consolidate it for that department. Like I'm thinking like sales department, marketing department, right? I'm buying, the department is buying data from web scraping data from a website, right? They've got to bring that in forward. Where does that come? How do you land that in your, in your department, right? Cause that department needs the competitive pricing of whatever your product is, right? And then I think you go full enterprise where at the enterprise level, we look at the department level reporting and say, what of the things that these different departments are building are now required to be reported at the whole company level, right? We're now talking about financial reporting, regular sales numbers, common dimensions and facts for um, mm -hmm. customers and um, products, right? These are things that should be across the enterprise agreed upon and calculated the same way. So everyone's speaking the same language. A thousand percent. Does this make sense? Like, so to me, percent. so this is, this is the, this is the grow up story. Start with data flows, grow up into pipelines and eventually land at the top of the pyramid with enterprise BI using a combination of pipelines, notebooks, and data flows to load your data. And the further up that pyramid you go, the less you're doing in data flows and the more you're lifting over to pipeline and spark engines. I, I would even argue more that with data flows gen two, and I think we're going to see a lot more come from it where 
you may have with spark um and at least pipelines less actions done there it's really meant for the data ingestion um pulling together some structured tables but yeah allowing the business user where it's really not data engineer for scenario two that persona um i think we need to spend an entire episode defining actual developer personas that actually exist because there are the ones here data engineer data integrator um business analysts, I think there's too much overlap and too much um, uh, or lack of clarity in terms of what that person is at an organization. Are they part of the BI team? What skills and tools do they know? Where data flows are now, to me, upgraded more than what we talked about just in reporting solutions. Mm -hmm. And it can be that business user or the citizen developer who knows the, um, those line of business, the logic, and now can actually push that to the lake house mm. that can be used in APIs. It can be used in the power platform uh, to connect where they have that, they are that um, liaison between the IT and the business. Yeah. I think more so, than Spark and, uh, or more than the data engineer. So I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not, I don't disagree with you, Mike, from the standpoint that teams organizational like department organizational might be using different methods for tra data transformation i guess and, and that probably has part of the story of like how we grow up things but to me the how part matters less than the actual object meaning like the table of information and mm -hmm. what it means and who uses it because if if i if i have reporting at a team level that is is that team level using the same source of information that we're using on the organizational level and the, the it's probably no so how do i get yes a, a report that is at a team level through those stages yes in this ecosystem to the mm -hmm. point where uh, there are possibilities to use the same levels of objects that are created in one lake and that's yes. where this like that's the important part in under having the organization understand that those are artifacts that they should be using as opposed to just creating this environment where everybody can build their own thing. Mm -hmm. So I guess my closing thoughts are, I think Matthew Roach's grow up story should be part of this to some degree. And if it's on us to like figure out once again, how to do it all, the frameworks there in much more the same way that I think all this is consolidated into a ecosystem. Mm -hmm. I think the levels of difficulty should be part of documentation, right? Like yes. if we're going to level up a business user, make it easy for them when they interact with the technical documentation. Like, yeah. Hey, you're you're brand new. This is a great place for you to start. Then you can talk intermediate and yes. enterprise. Yep. Um, and then like overall, the you know, like I think the challenge for us is how do we how do we figure out how this unified platform is is going to work with the structures that we have related to like workspaces and these objects that we're, you know, apparently creating and utilizing and want to reuse within organizations. Um, how, do, how does that all fit into place so that everybody's on the same page? Just because we create this environment that allows a whole bunch of more users to do things doesn't mean that it's, it's beneficial yet, right? Like, and finding like how we, we're still going to have the same problems in analytics, mm -hmm. which is, uh, and data, which is finding the sources of information that are the most reliable and most valuable to the organization. And does that mean everything has to be enterprise? No, it absolutely yep. does not. Yep. But it does mean that we need to approach this in a way that the organization understands how to utilize the systems that we're just automatically opening the doors on. Mm hmm Awesome. So uh, I'll do, uh, as we wrap here, I'll load out here with uh, the chat GPT. And I think this answer from chat GPT is like 100% spot on, especially what we were talking about today. So I asked two questions to chat GPT. The first one was, what is a data engineer and what skills, what skills should they have to be effective at a large organization? So just like, let's just define data engineer verbatim. A data engineer is a type of software engineer. So my, my understanding would be is, this is a person who's studied software engineering or software developer or computer science or something along that realm. They have a, they work with sets of data to create data pipelines, processing software, and they're responsible for preparing data and analytical operational uses, ensuring quality, reliability, and security. I agree with that hundred percent. A data engineer is thinking about regularly getting data, 
and making sure that it loads regularly. Here's the list of skills. Proficiency in programming languages such as Python, Java, Scala, or SQL. Knowledge in data structures, algorithms, design patterns. Experience with big data frameworks such as Hadoop, Spark, Kafka, Airflow. I wouldn't need all those, but like Spark would be the one I'd want right. to make sure they have skills on, right? Familiarity with cloud platforms, AWS, Azure, or GCP. Which, if we go back to our argument here earlier, yeah. Mary, our citizen developer, not what I would argue, engineer. does not need to know all the different clouds. And like she's it's not a not a data engineer. Not a data engineer. So True. don't use. And, and I think that's part of the thing. Don't start confusing. Yes. People who work with data as data engineers. They're not. You're going to lose people. Correct. And then the last couple points for the data engineer, which would be understanding data quality, understanding governance, and security principles and best practices. You're now talking about the scope of delivery of the data in addition to just producing tables of data. Okay. The next one was a question around what is a citizen developer and what can they be to be effective in a large organization? This one I really like. A citizen developer is a tech savvy user, end user, with the ability to create new software features or application programs in from an approved corporate or cloud based code system. So basically, someone else has built something and I'm building on top of it. They are empowered business users that create a new or change existing business applications without the need to involve an IT department. They're using low or no code solutions mm -hmm. and platforms that use visual tools to build pre-built components to create and update applications. And I would argue not an application, an update or up, you know, create or update data solutions, right? That's how I would change that phrase there. They have business acumen, domain knowledge. They are creative and innovative in designing user-friendly data solutions. Uh, they have basic understanding of software development, best principles and practice. They are familiar with, I don't know what L, N, C, and C platforms are. You know what that is? I've never heard of that one before. I don't know what that is. I probably should know what that is. I just never heard of it. But they're familiar with, um, low, uh, okay, it abbreviated. Low, Chat low, low, no, low, code, low code, no, no code. code. L, L, C, N, C. <laughs> so apparently that's an abbreviation I should know. Low code. So they are familiar with low code, no code solutions and th that are sanctioned and governed by IT. Another key point here, right? It's kind of like, here's things you can use given to you by the IT organs. The ability to test, debug, and maintain applications and uh, good communication skills to work with other IT professionals, data engineers, to develop what you need for reporting. I thought that was really spot on. It's good. It's so I, good. I think the article was okay. I think I would have incorporated more about the data grow up story. And I think we probably would have definitely rebuilt these scenarios such that they were forming a um, grow up story from a personal reporting solution all the way to enterprise reporting solutions. That's to me is the, is the story that we're, we're missing for this one. Excellent. Well, with that we've burned through a perfectly good hour of your time. We appreciate your time. Thank you all so much. Um, I had a lot of fun talking about this one. Great. Beating up this process here. I really liked how this is thinking, but um, with that, all we really ask of the podcast is we really love our audience. You guys are so great, wonderful in the chat. Love uh, hearing all the conversation there. We really appreciate you. Our only ask is please share it with somebody else. If you thought this was good, if you felt there was some insight here that you liked, uh, please share it on social media or someone in your organization or talk to somebody else about the podcast. Tommy, where else can you find the podcast? You can find the podcast anywhere it's available. YouTube, um, Apple, Spotify. Make sure to subscribe. Listen to all our previous episodes. Uh, we're doing this little series on that decision guide. Listen to our previous one. Listen to the next one. Uh, don't forget, if you want to for, have us talk about a certain topic in fabric, go to powerbi.tips slash the podcast, and we have a mailbag. Submit what you want us to talk about. Awesome. Thank you all so much, and we'll see you next time.